Hi guys, welcome to the Last Set Podcast, episode 145, back from a two-week hiatus, and um, today I'm joined by my brother Mark, waiting on Johnny. What's happening, brother? Not much, man. How are you? I'm doing really well. Uh, it, fe- it feels strange because I'm so used to doing this once a week now, twice a week, and then when I haven't done it for like a couple of weeks, I'm like, oh my God, what's going on? It feels, <laughs> it feels, stra- it feels strange. Yeah. It feels seasoned now because um, you know, what is it? Just turned twenty four last yesterday. Yeah, and happy birthday, man! Thank you, thank <laughs> you. And I've done this for more than two years, and I'm just like, oh, okay. So this is this is what it feels like, you know. Is it kind of like missing like a training session? It's like mm. it's so in your routine now. It is. It is. It's like you know when you um, you know when you take a deload week. And then you yeah. touch the bar for the first time. You're like, oh, this is this is different. Yeah, that's kind of what it feels like right now. Mm. I mean, uh, I'm so used to doing this for a while, but I got I got to tell you, it's, there's a lot of satisfaction and pl- and uh, gratitude you get when you stick to something for so long. Yeah, it's like uh, for me, it's like when I hit that 150, it's going to be like, well, you remember when you would try to deadlift four plates for the first time? <laughs> that feeling? Yeah. That's that's what it's going to feel like, you know? I do remember that, yeah. yeah. So what's been happening, man? Man, it's off-season now. Um, just trying to put some size on for the next comp next year. Enjoying all the food. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. What's, um, what's r- since the last time we spoke... What's changed for you, like, physically-wise and training-wise since the last competition? Man, so I guess coming out of comp, it was slowly increasing the calories weekly, fortnightly, and then monthly kind of thing. So the baseline diet was, like, about 1,800, 1,900 calories, which is fuck all. Which is... To be fair, it's it's fuck all, I guess, to us. But like for some people, that's a lot of calories on prep. <laughs> yeah. Some people it gets down real low. Um, but yeah, so training sort of ramped up in accordance to the calorie increase. So as we started consuming more calories, training could sort of increase in intensity, kind of thing. Um, dialed it back to five days a week, um, just because the six days a week was kind of to just keep our energy expenditure up, burn those calories and having those six days meant you could push the volume, uh, metric a bit higher, but keep, we like, you can't really push the intensity on prep. Like nice. you've just got nothing in the tank. Nice. Like you go in and every session's kind of just like a six out of 10, just like go through the motions, like try and get a pump, but like you just sort of gas out and there's nothing there and you don't really feel anything. Yeah. Now it's like, F- phenomenal though yeah i mean <laughs> you know it's well the best thing i always hear is like oh because you go from a period of being so depleted and then you chuck on all that ex- all that extra weight and all that but like you told me just like yesterday how much did you gain back since how much how heavy uh were you when you stepped on stage did they did they weigh you yeah so while well, i was weighing myself every day and show day both show days was around like 65 65 and a half kilos um, which at just shy of six feet tall is pretty pretty lightweight, <laughs> baby. <laughs> yeah, um, hashtag short kings. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, since then it's but what been like five months now, and I've put on I want to say eight and a half kilos, almost nine since comp. Um, granted, some of that is going to just be water weight, um, just food weight, and just general fluid retention from just eating more calories. But looking at sort of my progress pictures now from I'm currently averaging about 74, 74 and a half kilos, um, my current 74 kilos compared to sort of the last time I was 74 kilos during prep, it's a lot leaner with a lot more muscle, which is great to see, which means like coming out of comp, like we've, I've actually put on some lean tissue in these past five months. And sort of that reverse diet process was successful. Like coming out of comp, it's really easy just to like eat everything in sight and then gain all the weight back and then it's just all fat. But I was able to sort of 
um, gain it all back in a controlled manner and it all the weight go to the right places kind of thing. Yeah. You seem generally a lot more happier now. That's one thing I've <laughs> noticed about you. I remember when it was like four weeks leading up to the competition, I'd walk in just standing there, standing there with your arms crossed, just like half asleep. Oh. And I'm just like, man, it, one thing I'm actually talking to a couple of guys, like we know Ollie next door. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, shout out to Ollie. He's getting ready for his competition. He's looking absolutely saucy right now. Dude, he's like he's saying when you're on prep, time goes by so slowly. <laughs> do you believe that's the correct? The, the, do you believe that's true? Yeah, it's kind of. Be, it's like because every day is just like Groundhog Day kind of vibes. It's the same shit over and over again. And as your calories get lower, sort of that food focus gets higher and that sort of lingering hunger in the back of your mind is just there, is constantly there as you decrease the calories and as you get deeper into prep. And so that sort of gives you that kind of time dilation thing because you eat a meal and it's like, oh, where'd the food go? And now you're waiting three, four hours for the next one and it's just like you're sitting there like, fuck, I'm hungry. <laughs> Where's my next meal? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, that's that's just the hardest. That's just the hardest thing for me because I was saying to me like, he, Ollie was saying to me as well. It's one of those things you have to do, and you can't really be focusing on anything else. Like you have to shut down all these other things, and for me, that's one of the biggest reasons why I don't want to do it because mm. I, I I like the idea of just doing a lot of uh, a fair few things. Like I do a fair amount, but having to shut everything down and focus on one thing, it's a, it definitely a skill on its own. It's just something I don't really want to gravitate towards. However, I mean, after doing this podcast now for a good couple of years and speaking to a whole bunch of bodybuilders, I, I do start to feel a lot more respect for the sport. Um, do I feel like there could be some definitely some changes in it? Why in the hell not? I think mm. it's, but also the, one of the biggest things I learned is like everyone could do it, but the ones who get past doing it once are pretty much in it for the long term. That's, yeah, that's it. Because... Once you do it once and you get the test and people say, oh, they do it once and don't want to fucking do it again. And mm. so it happens because it's the first time I've ever been to that state. So once, well, when I've got all these people I know are doing their first show, I'm just like, I'm quite eager to see where they go after the first show. Yeah. 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 So what's the situation now for you? Are you planning on stepping on, uh, holding off for the rest of the year or do you want to start beginning of next year? Where do we aim to go? Yeah, so the current plan is to put on size until sort of, I want to say, June or July next year and sort of see how much size we've put on, what sort of position I'm at for, like, I decide to prep again because the aim is for the Season B show next year, so, like, October-ish. Wait, so you're going to wait a whole year? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's... That's crazy, man. Because, like, for natural athletes, it's, like especially at the beginning of sort of your quote-unquote career in bodybuilding, it you need to take long sort of off-seasons to put on the size and make the improvement show to show. Um, unless you're sort of like your sort of starting point before competing is just like so high, like you can afford to take those shorter off-seasons and compete sort of more periodically. Um, for me, like... <clears throat> the main issue was just I didn't have the muscle yet and that's a time thing. Like I had the conditioning, I had the shape, I had everything else it, and the posing, whatever, but it's just the muscle wasn't there and as we know, putting on muscle takes a very long time oh, fuck, yeah. and you can't rush that process, especially as a natural athlete and sort of that, <clears throat> that time between shows, at least a quarter or a third of it is just recovering from the first show and that period of time you don't have it's not productive training you're not putting any you might put on a tiny bit of muscle that you might have lost but the gains you would make otherwise are minimal to none it's not until you hit that caloric like get to maintenance calories and then you start upping the calories where you're in a caloric surplus your training is productive you're pushing the intensity that's where sort of the muscle growth happens but until you get to that point, there's not much happening coming out of the comp, and that can take, for some people, a couple months, like three, four, five months. Yeah. Depen a lot. Depen depending on how you do it, like there's a couple ways of doing it. Like I, Vince, Keisha, and I, myself, we sort of took the 
slow approach, reverse diet, sort of play it safe. Other people like to do what's called a recovery diet. So they'll instantly shoot up the calories to close to, if not met their maintenance calories, um, <clears throat> and try and shorten that window of window of time where you're just recovering from that competition. Yeah, I remember you were telling me you were incredibly happy when the fact that you got to eat what was it, a whole pizza one night? What was the what was the crazy oh, yeah, food eating you did? It was um whole fucking no, it was more it was like one and a half pizzas and one and a half get chunky cookies. Fuck. How many <laughs> calories is in one of those cookies though? So it's a anywhere from I wanna say seven fifty to a thousand calories, depending on what cookie you get. Uh, I don't know the official numbers, and even if I did, legally I'm not actually allowed to say it. Uh, okay. <laughs> so okay. I can only guesstimate. Uh, okay. All right. So that's actually a good point that you wanted, wanted to bring up as well. That's one of the things I wanted, uh, wanted to ask you and Johnny about when he gets his ass in here. Uh, Johnny, if you listen, man, hurry the fuck up. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> also, Cal, if you're listening, man, hope you're doing well. Um, Oh, by the way, just to go off topic as well, guys, we are five episodes away from 150. Let's go. And it's going to be, it's fucking go. And that 150 episode is going to be a Saturday session. I will not take no for an answer because there are guests who will be coming on between now and then. But Sat- did you know that Saturday sessions have been some of the most downloaded episodes of the year? Damn. Yeah. So, boys, I mean, if you're listening, that 150 episode you're going to be on, Cal, I'm going to get you in here. If you if you uh, think about going south, I'll go get you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll leg lock your ass and get your ass back here. So uh, anyway, back to the uh, back to the conversation. So one thing I've been seeing a lot of lately. I don't know where our culture is going, but you know what a mukbang is. I do know what a mukbang is. Yes, you know I keep seeing all these fucking like videos for it and articles for it, like mukbangs, and like I'm like people are literally starving in Africa and people are paying money. To watch someone just eat a shitload of food. It's awful, yeah. But, but here's one of the weirdest things I've always always thought. In the fitness industry, you want to be a promotion of health. You want to be a promotion of, like, ideal physique or, you know, something for people can aspire to. How the fuck do you do that when, you can, when you're can doing, like, 10,000, 20,000 calorie challenges, like, stuff in your face full of McDonald's? Like, that can't be. Yeah, so it's kind of like that, Um, what do you call it? Um, what's the word? Uh, eating disorder. So mm. a lot of like a lot of the glamour um, of bodybuilding and fitness itself is is like a veil. It's hiding away all the shit that goes behind the scenes and all the toxic relationships with food, your body, like body image disorders, that kind of thing. It all comes hand in hand, but None of it's really shown on like social media and stuff. No. Um, and like it, like that sort of idea of the mukbang or like that big day of eating, 10K calorie challenge, cheat day, cheat meal. Um, a lot of it comes from like that sort of old school mentality of like bodybuilders trying to like refuel on their like diet to like stoke the metabolism when they're cutting and that kind of thing. And it's just promoting like this binge. Um, starvation, binge starvation cycle kind of thing. And it's not healthy at all. <laughs> no, no. Um, what, and it also goes into changes up their mentality. They they go into, you know, the realm of dirty bulking. I've been very critical about this on the past. I've had um, other bodybuilders and telling me that dirty bulking is like, it's a fucking no, dangerous, no. dangerous road to go down on. Like um, even, what's his name? Jeff Side. Yeah, he, he just... Look, he went on it recently. Recently, yeah. And then he put a, a photo, so I was like, bruh, that was that was really hard to watch as well. You know? it, it's funny because, like, his, like, his quote-unquote fat is, like, everyone's, like, dream-shredded physique still. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Even though he's, like, bloated as fuck, but, like, you can still see the shreds there. Yeah. He was one of the OG fitness models, though, like... Old school, you, man. Was, I mean, did, he was one of those people that everyone used to just, like, look up to. And then he just kind of went silent for quite some time and now he's just popped up again and all. I think it's either to do with, like, he didn't adapt to the times or he just didn't want a part of where everything's going. Yeah. I reckon it's one of those two things, like, especially with all the, 
like the TikTok trends and that kind of thing and yeah. how yeah. fitness is sort of evolving over the years. He either didn't keep up with it or he wanted to do something completely different and stay away from it. Yeah, n- no, you're right about that because he was one of the original YouTubers mm. and then back in, like, let's say, bef- let's say Rewind O'Clock's like 10 years ago, if you wanted to be a fitness influencer, kind of the only way to do that was for YouTube. YouTube because yeah. didn't YouTube come first before Instagram? Yeah, YouTube. Instagram, and then Instagram came along and then it was just one or two avenues. We didn't have Reels. Facebook was... I don't know. Facebook was different. Facebook was more on the business side of things. Yeah. But people were either influenced through YouTuber or Instagram. And he was one of those originals along with, um, you know, like Steve Cook and there was a couple of other guys out there, but can't to name a few, but Rich Piano being my favorite. Um, <laughs> I love that fucking dude. When he was, yeah. Um, it's a shame about what happened to him. But where I'm going with this is like ever since Reels and TikTok came along, the fitness influence, inf- uh, it became anyone could have been a fitness influencer now right and the reason why is sometimes here's where i feel like we're going with it is you could have you if you apply yourself it still takes a lot of work i'll give you that but if you want to be a fitness influencer on tiktok it doesn't take that long compared to what it would take on youtube Mm. because youtube itself was a skill where you have to learn to edit videos you have to film your content you have to go out there into the world and face you know being judged for filming yourself in gyms but nowadays it's like camera 10 second clips boom ten thousand views so where do you uh, so that brings me to my next point i just wanted to ask you mark where do you think it's going now in terms of like that do you think we've peaked what do you think it's going to go even further? Man, that's hard. It's, man, I think obviously YouTube is that sort of long form kind of content where you have to sit down and actually pay attention for a long time and not a long time, but like 10, 15 minutes kind of thing. Yeah. And obviously everyone's attention pa- attention spans get shorter and shorter, but it's also as we grow older, we have less and less time and so we have less time to consume these long form <clears throat> uh, forms of media and so we have to re- resort to those short forms such as TikTok and Reels mm-hmm. but it's also I think a result of like fitness at its core or trying to get fit or improving your body is just consistent repetition of the basics no one but no one wants to fucking hear that yeah and you can only say that so many times as well and so now it's kind of like we're we're past that sort of that age of fitness or that age of fitness social media where it's like we can rely on these core fundamentals that core fundamentals of fitness that are useful and will actually get you somewhere and now it's now that we're in the age of TikTok and Reels. Now it's we need that, we need that catch. We need that grab, like the quick attention grabbing video or something crazy happening in the video, that kind of thing. And so, yeah, I, I'm not sure where it's going to go from here, though. Yeah. I just feel like now people, because of TikTok and his, and Reels, their not even their attention span is becoming shorter, but their ability to be more their gullibility that's a fucking word (laughs) (laughs) is becoming so much so much more shorter yeah do you remember when let's rewind the clocks back 15 years if you wanted to know information you'd have to go onto the internet read about it or go find a book and read about it now it's a tiktok on every six six video you watch Mm. but there's never been now more i've said it so many times there's never been now more Access to bad information. Have you ever been on TikTok? Um, I've been off TikTok lately ever since the whole Andrew Tate situation, which is something <laughs> I wanted to talk about later on down the line. But uh, what is it? Do you ever see that TikTok where it's a doctor and it's a stitch and next to it is them just saying, oh, I'll take this every day to lose body fat and it's just literally coffee and a lemon. And people actually believe that shit. If I just squeeze a few drops of lemon juice into a fucking coffee, drink it black, and then don't eat for six hours or whatever, oh, and then they man. think that's going to help you burn fat twice faster, right? I'm like, if you are doing that and you think it's working, you are fucking dreaming. And But I keep seeing it all the time. And, you know, it's a tri- and then there was an article about it. I'm like, oh, my God. And that's what I mean. If I look back at all the previous trends that people have fucking done that have just been stupid and all that, 
Like, do you remember Tide Pods? Mm. Everyone was fucking eating Tide Pods. <laughs> All that bullshit. Um, nah, man. I'm actually, truth be told, I'm actually trying to stay off social media these days. I'm actually mm. on it a lot less. Uh, uh, mainly because there's a bunch of things I'm doing right now that I'm trying to get done. And then I realized how much time I'm actually wasting on yeah. on social media. And TikTok is fucking... TikTok says so the the algorithm purposely I think it's gonna it's gonna make you see stuff you like, but then it's also gonna chuck in stuff you hate just to make you purposely unhappy and all that, you know. Yeah. Like sometimes I'll um look like as I like look back through the day of what I've done and I count or like yeah, count how long like how many minutes or how many hours I've spent on social media. Yeah. I'm like, Jesus Christ, I've wasted one or two hours. I could have been doing something productive. There we go. Yeah. It's like, shit. <laughs> yeah. I realized I had a bit of a problem when I was working out and then I realized how much time I actually spend working out and all that. Yeah. Awesome. Lovely. So, uh, so <laughs> as I was saying, uh, spend like how much time I actually spend working out like why my workouts are taking like more than an hour and a half mm. which I realized was so bad now my workouts take up to 45 minutes first thing in the morning and it's just because I don't watch TikTok the reels during in between sets in between sets yeah because that's what most people do <laughs> yeah I've seen that so much you know yeah well I don't think workouts are supposed to take any more long it really it depends it does depend. Depends. If you're in a gym trying to do hypertrophy I don't feel like you should be working out for any more than an hour. Yeah I think any like as as time increases spent in the gym like doing hypertrophy work the quality of work just drops so much mm-hmm. because <clears throat> it's not like where it's like for example powerlifting where you might end up spending like an hour and a half two hours in the gym because you got to do 10 sets of bloody three on squats at like 85 90 percent of your one rep max but the, to do that you need to rest longer but for hypertrophy, that's not necessarily the case. And so, <clears throat> yeah, I don't think you need to be spending that much time if you're just doing hypertrophy work. Good, good. It, good. Might, it might, maybe for a leg day or some sort of high volume day, which you might need to dedicate a little bit more time. But for something like arms, <laughs> you don't need... Spent, be spending more than an hour in the gym, uh, nah, let alone 30 how, minutes. Yeah, considering how much of a small uh, muscle group it is, and yeah. something like forearms or calves, you know, it doesn't really need to have it. But if there's certain things you got to break down into it, you know. Like, for example, um, if you're doing a couple of body groups, okay, I can understand. Mm. The volume would be a lot higher, obviously. Uh, but... One thing I've actually found out as well, like uh, 45 minutes, I feel like I can get more done if I just eliminate the junk volume, keep the RPE high, and then I don't have to um, do any these like, long, stretched-out workouts. Yeah, well, I think it's <clears throat> it's kind of like people just tend to do too much volume anyway, as you said, junk volume, and it's because people haven't learned to push that intensity like Mm. people don't know what a true even myself like i still struggle to gauge what my rpe or rir is set to set and especially for beginners and intermediates it's like they are really undershooting how hard they're actually training um a good a good uh sort of fail safe way of um not doing that is just try and take a set to complete failure and then each session and try and like gauge from that one set but the issue here is that um there's i can't remember who did the study but there's a study where they um told the participants to um like go to failure on the bench press like for a 10 rep max or something and then <clears throat> i can't remember what the structure was but when they when they got the results the particip- participants were undershooting their sort of like what they thought was a 10 rep max was actually like a 20 rep max. So they're like undershooting it by like a hundred percent basically. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, here's the other thing I've noticed as well, just since we're on our topic of jump volume, when did jump volumes, I think it's a very new principle that came around. Well, it's, I don't think it's been around for a while. It's a new principle, but I think a lot of just like the fitness sort of that, literature is new in general yeah like it has not been like the quote-unquote sort of fitness sphere has hasn't really been around for more than 
I want to say like 100 years, like you're looking at maybe the early 1900s with like Eugene Sandow and sort of those showmen and strongmen doing all the circus events. That's where it sort of all originated from. And that like, that's only like 100 years now, basically. Yeah. And then the research itself has only really started, you know, maybe less than half of that. Yeah. Because looking back, I feel like the philosophy to training has changed greatly. But let's say, for example, back in Arnold's days, have you ever read his autobiography? I have not read his autobiography. I have read the uh, the Encyclopedia of Bodybuilding, though. <laughs> that really thick, thick book. Yeah, sorry, Johnny's here. Door, door is unlocked. <laughs> <laughs> He's yeah, he knows where we are. Uh, I was always saying um, because. Back in Arnold's days, he was like twice a day, two hours minimum a day, obviously because he was on the source. But even if I don't think the professionals would even recommend that to, to by today's standards, I don't because I've ne- right now I've always preached you should ne- never, not really train to failure if it's solely for hypertrophy reasons. You should always be two or three reps in reserve. Yeah, that's sort of what the, the the direction the literature is pointing at is you don't need to go to absolute failure to elicit Keep going. Um, hypertrophy because <clears throat> you essentially make sort of the same amount of gains just from just hitting shy of sort of um, failure at two to three reps in reserve. Hey, Johnny. Um, but on the topic of that sort of super high volume back in Arnold's day... Um, that was sort of one end of the spectrum, but on the on the other end of the spectrum, you had um, like Mike Menser and um, his jeez, <laughs> Mike Menser and his um, brother. They were sort of promoting that that heavy duty training sort of system where it's super low volume and super high intensity, and it was sort of a flip the flip side of sort of Arnold's. Um, philosophy on training and that sort of evolved into sort of um going into the 80s and 90s with dorian yates and that kind of thing and so you had these two kind of camps where you have the super high volume guys and the low volume guys but like super high intensity so we interrupt this broadcast to see oh, we have a new guest <laughs> i mean hey guys hey guys good me it's again he's missing part johnny welcome man what's happening dude Bro, it's been so busy, man, especially at the gym and at the moment with uh, nationals coming up. Yeah. So I'm back and forth at the gym today, so I have to get back and do a few things after this as well. Oh, really? Is yeah. it that, that busy today? It's very busy, man, because we're two weeks out. Wow. So we're preparing everything right now, so from yeah. the lifters to the venue to the function as well. So. Oh, is it going to be here? Yep, it's in uh, WA. I thought Australia. nationals was going to be over east. What was something I saw just recently? Um, I think you are talking about breakthrough powerlifting. Ah, oh, okay. That could be. That's happening today, right now in Sydney. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. So where's this nationals going to be? How is it going to be? At Ruchi's gym at the um, local um, Malaga. So guys, come down in two weeks' time. If you're not sure, head down to Instagram, mm. search up Ruchi's gym, and you'll see uh, the GBC nationals all over there. Mm. Nice, nice, good man. W- tell tell us about you. you're going to be competing. No, 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 I will not be competing. I'll be an official, so I'll be there for the whole of day one. So spotting, loading, and just being a man on the platform. That's going to be really fun. Uh, hopefully, I won't have to catch a lot of weights because I know every lifter there is very, very high quality. So I know there won't be a lot of bar dumping at all. Yeah, and how's the training been? I remember last time we spoke, you told me you were dealing with some nagging injuries and all yeah, that. So change yeah. now. Um. Well, today I kind of sort of flared up an old injury, my AC Mm. joint. I went, I think, just a bit of dumbbell incline presses, just went a bit too heavy with that. Had a bit of fun with a mate, you know, when you get carried away with training a bit, but that's okay. (laughs) Um, Still managed to pull back on a few exercises just to kind of keep that under the wraps for a bit, but it's sort of sore right now. Um, That's the only main one at the moment. Yeah. Well, just to fill you in on what we were talking about earlier, me and Buck were discussing... uh, we talk, We were just talking about junk volume, mm, yeah, mm, mm, and how it, I believe it's a new concept that's actually sort of just not been around for. It's not mm. been around for uh, very long, yeah. Because back in the day, everyone was like, "Oh, you got to the more hours you're spending in the gym, the better." Yep, yeah. And now it's now becoming something that, yeah. you know, I feel like over time now by eliminating jump volume, my workouts are better. 
because I'm pushing a lot more intensively, but for a shorter period of time. And then we also saw how does that relate to you in terms of a power lifter? Like, cause you've got to be very precise on each lift, you know? Yeah, exactly. So the whole thing is when you're peaking for a meet, right? You do not want to be holding a lot of volume on meet day because that's fatigue, right? So basically with how, let's say a powerlifting program works, it's like something called like wave block periodization where you start wave increasing intensities then dropping it and increase it even more and dropping it and kind of leveraging off the laws of supercompensation. Um, basically, when you're leading up to your comp, you want to slowly descend that volume but increase the load because that th because it's kind of like inversely related. You can't go high and hard with lots of sets and reps all the time and expect to lift heavy. So I think as we know, it's an inverse relationship. So on the day, you want to keep your volume low and your fatigue levels low. So you know that on the day, you can give 100% maximum all kilos on the platform. Nice, nice. And do you have anything coming up at the moment? Um, my next comp is on the 26th of March, 2023. That's the USAPL drug tested um, Perth Power Series. So it's going to be the old pee in the cup. Yeah, yeah the um, random drug testing, pee in the cup. Uh, I think someone gets to watch you pee in the cup just to make sure that you're not cheating or anything like that. Yeah, <laughs> done that. It's going to be fun. <laughs> the old fetish. Uh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, so now I wanted to bring this up, guys, because, uh, you know, I didn't have any sort of questions. Mm. So, Super. Joe, before you yeah. start, since when was US USAPL coming to Australia? Um, I think that was into fruition for about four months already yeah oh, so wow. it's been it's been in the works maybe in like six months but it's been very fast i think usapo has always wanted to expand yeah. and i think is their this is their step at taking it international oh. so it's usapo australia usapo korea i think there's one england canada coming up sure. so it's kind of like the other federation against the ipf yeah 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 is this the first time it's ever been here in perth Yes, so the recent comp that happened uh, a few weeks ago, the USAPL Perth Power Series, um, that was the first one in Perth. Yeah. <laughs> okay, before I get on to the main question, I've got to uh, ask this quick, real quick, right? I just noticed that both of you shave your arms. I don't. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no, man. Been, what? No, hey, no I'm looking over here. You guys got not a single hair on your arms. No, what? no, I shave no. my legs, but yeah. not, my, not my arms. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm yeah. just Asian, bro. I've got hairy legs, but just nothing in my arms. Really? Yeah. I thought you would yeah. be the shaving them as well. Don't you have to with the bar ride and all? No, 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 mate. You could grease up the old shins and I'm straight. <laughs> oh, ain't no pussy bro what the hell <laughs> come on man <laughs> okay now i wanted to bring this up because it's i've been dying to talk about this so the last three guests i was gonna have on i was gonna have one i was gonna have a doctor on i was mm. gonna have an author on and mm. i was gonna have an anthropologist on because mm. one thing i've been dying to talk about lately is this fucking shit that's going around with andrew tate i love andrew tate i fucking love it yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. like uh for those of you who don't list who don't know right now uh, if you've been living under a fucking rock, Andrew Tay is this, he's a world champion kickboxer who, who's who been, he's, he's like an entrepreneur, he's a owner of casinos, he started that webcam girl business and in his last, I would say, seven, eight months, he's just exploded to becoming probably the most, like, the most famous, maybe not the most famous, but the most oh, well-known you know, out there, you know, individual. And then recently, I think it was like two, two weeks ago, he got banned off everything. His website got taken down. And uh, I've been dying to talk about what people think, what you guys think about it, especially. What do you think? Do you think that it was justified? Well, to be completely honest, I actually haven't been following anything Andrew Tate related. Like I only see occasional things pop up on my social media where it's like all these big controversies, but I have, I've pretty much been living under a rock when it comes to Andrew Tate. Oh, okay. Yeah, <laughs> I don't actually know much about him. Yeah. Andrew Tate's my guy. Um, yeah. <laughs> might be a controversial opinion, but I do believe he holds some fact and truth in a few matters. I know that he's ruffled a lot of feathers with um, the whole female community and the equal rights party. Um, yeah. He said a lot of bad things. Oh, women are property. Um, that's a, that's a big one. That's caused a lot of, uh, rice among people. I do believe of how he kind of attacks, um, the weak society that we kind of live in right now. Oh, I was saying. Yeah. He kind of puts stuff in people's mouths and minds of 
what we were thinking, let's say, 10, 20 years ago. Um, because society has changed so much to become such a, like an equal and quote-unquote woke uh, place right now, how everyone has to have, you know, a certain filter to say things. Andrew Tate has no filter. No. Yeah. No. So I think that's why he's being banned because society has nowadays, we have so much filters like the Twitter filter, Facebook, Instagram, people trying to fight Mark Zuckerberg because they're silencing, <laughs> <laughs> they're silencing uh, he's silencing their opinions on Instagram. So I think that's why it's because society is trying to put a filter on the truth. Yeah. yeah. Did Mark, didn't you get the Zuck hammer? Yeah. Well, it wasn't for any like um, controversial, controversial reason. Like I was just going through sort of my um, <clears throat> followers and following sort of list and getting rid of all the bots. Oh, but then yeah. as a result, like Instagram flagged me as a bot. And so I got, I got banned. Um, and I tried to appeal it. I had to send in this bloody mug shot with like a piece of paper with my like, Instagram <laughs> yeah. handle yeah. trying to get it back. But I never got a response. And so I had to start a new new Instagram. Mm. Mm. So it wasn't for the nudity? No. <laughs> I was going to say, man, it's that Dorito shape, bro. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's the funny, that's the weird, that's the weirdest thing that's going on right now. Like, um, Instagram's like, oh yeah, you can't post nudity or whatever. But then you look at, bodybuilders who are literally just wearing strings on stage <laughs> with mm. the bulge and all yeah. that and then no one's calling that shit out and all that yeah I, i'd love to sit down and talk to someone who works on let's say the moderation team to see yeah. what kind of filter what kind of ai or like mm. whatever like what form are they using to s signal out yeah yeah well i would too i mean if but i don't think we have anything like that i mean how how many hours would you be working a day just going through everyone's frigging content just mm whenever or not it's acceptable and all that. You must have like an army of room for those I people. mean, it's probably like the reason why I didn't get unbanned. It's just like prob no one probably got around to doing it because there's just so many things to look through. Mm -hmm. Like you can't look through all of them. Yeah. Well, then that goes to the idea, like how did they prioritize it? Like they must have been waiting or something mm -hmm. on uh, Andrew Tate and all that. They probably didn't even, uh, uh, what is it, investigate it. They probably just got rid of him straight away and all that, you know. He was on there for quite a while. Yeah. I don't just think it's just the uproar of a lot of people just trying to be, trying to apply pressure to say Facebook, Instagram, et cetera, all those guys in the high positions to do something. And I think it's a pretty good PR move as well. It kind of helps Facebook and Instagram um, hold more credibility that yes, we are for equal rights. Yes, we are for female rights. Mm -hmm. If we ban Andrew Tate, because a lot of people online or TikTok, the trend was like, oh yeah, um, F you Andrew Tate People yeah. making like reels About like Destroying Andrew Tate And stuff So I think that was Getting out of hand a bit That's yeah. why they, they banned him Yeah Well did you also notice As well that When he was off TikTok and Instagram And Facebook And all that He lost his website Hustlers University As well mm. Yeah That's yeah. another thing And then Now All these other podcasts And all these other shows are like being able to say whatever the fuck they want about him and even slander him or for defamational reasons. And uh, the next thing what happened was, is this is the interesting part, he went over to the app Rumble. Have mm. you heard of that? No. Mm. Uh, so it's like, an, it's like a YouTube slash podcast platform. So I can post like four minute videos of me, you know, riding around, training and all that. But I can also post... Vi like video podcasts of me as well like two hour formats mm. so it's like a halfway it's like another youtube slash podcast platform mm. when andrew tate went straight over to rumble the stock went up like through the fucking roof <laughs> like they got more downloads than tiktok more downloads than facebook more downloads than snapchat and Holy instagram shit, yeah. and no one's talking about it you're not seeing it in the media and there's a, not of course, not correlation doesn't mean causation, but there is a d fucking color correlation between him going on there. And yeah, Rumble's uh, stock prices. So I feel like also that's where we're also going as men um, in today's society. I feel like masculinity now has never been more discussed than ever. Mm. And I feel like now men have never looked to more role models now than ever. So when someone gets mad at following him, I was like, well, why do you think men follow him in the first place? That's where we're going. Um, but yeah, it goes down to the idea of censorship, you know, and I don't think it's great and all that. Anyway, moving on from there. Uh, so 
<clears throat> there was another thing I wanted to bring up as well. Uh, lately, I've been seeing this a lot as well because it's in regard to fitness and health as well. But you guys know Kenny Ko. I love Kenny Ko, <laughs> yeah. the OG man. Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah. You know how he's going around. Are you natural, bro? Are you natural? Are you natural? That's what I wanted to talk about and all that. Like transparency <laughs> within the fitness industry. Mm. Like, what's your take on it? Do you think it's important? I think it is important. Yeah. Um, don't lie. Don't lie and promote. A fake or just like don't yeah don't try and profit off of your don't try and profit off of other people's uh what do you how do you say it like <clears throat> they are believing something that is you're promoting is attainable but it's really unattainable and you're just you know taking their money kind of thing um yeah words aren't working right now johnny yeah, um, I, I see I see where Mark's coming from. Because as a kid, I was, yeah, man, I want to be like Carly Muscle. That dude's natty. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I was like this like t- teenager, my, me, just watching Carly Muscle's training videos, his uh, crazy prison prison style nutrition, which is like a whole <laughs> Tupperware of like ramen, <laughs> tuna, mayonnaise, ketchup, tomato sauce, anything you can find, like a 2,000 two calorie pre-workout meal. I tried that and it was disgusting. Did you? Yeah. <laughs> so I thought Kylie Muscle was natty, dude. We were actually just talking about that earlier, right? About how how weird it is that in the industry you want to be promoting health, you want to be mm. promoting fitness, but fucking binge eating is exactly. now like the most trending thing. Like people exactly. like pay thousands, people make thousands of dollars just off like mukbangs. Like another good one I want to bring up was Nicardo Avocado. Oh, that guy. Oh, no. oh, Do you know how much money that guy makes? Like an insane amount. Like yeah. we're talking, he's a millionaire. He's a multi-millionaire. Oh, yeah. shit. Wow. Uh, uh, if I thought that man is in crap, I don't know the exact figure, but whenever you go to his um, go to his Instagram, it's like pictures of him, like videos of him, like crying. I was eating food. I was like, is he, is he putting on an act or is he actually legit like that, you know? Yeah. But like going back to the Kenny KO thing, hey, like I think – Nowadays, with fitness influencers, um, the whole kind of feeling is uh, they're promoting transparency mm-hmm. and a lot of the following uh, appreciates transparency. And I think transparency brings education. Mm. So I think nowadays the platform is so large now, I think it's time to share correct information and not be misinformed versus previous years when the fitness industry was starting to boom. Um, athletes had to make money by making more supplement sales using this discount code, that discount mm. code. I think nowadays it's changing. So everyone wants to be informed now. Mm. Yeah. I just, I think you're right about not lying. I'm still waiting on that day. But there are some, but I feel like the more you hold on to it, the worse and worse it gets. Now, the argument is um, in terms of transparency, they say, oh, they're being open about it, they're educating people. But then if I flip that, I'm like, well, they're still role models. So what they're doing themselves, you know, okay, isn't 100% healthy. However, they're prom- trying to promote it. They feel like they're trying to promote it. And because they feel like, oh, the uh, physique is either way not naturally attained, kids are going to feel like, oh, I have to do this now in order to get there. Like, do you ever see, like, the rise of psalm goblins and all that sort of stuff? Like, this mm. is popularized right now. Like, mm. where are we going with this? Mm. Mm. Yeah, I think... Um yeah, man, fuck this. I'm just going to put Have you ever known anyone who's taken those? Uh, I think we have. We all know someone that's taken them before. Yeah, he's not here right now. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> 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 just kidding, just kidding. Um, yeah, no, like other than, yeah, I don't know anyone that's taken Psalms, I guess. Yeah, I know, I've known a few guys yeah. that took it. I'll tell the story. Back when I was in the uh, stripping days and all that, there was a guy who I knew that took Psalms. He did put on a bit of muscle, but he literally just like his liver was producing producing all these oh. enzymes, all that it was all bloated and oh, stuff. That's and disgusting. When I saw him, he just right it looked like he had a bubble gut and all that. Well, that's the thing with like their research chemicals. It's like the it's still a lot of point where there's just like not enough research and literature on them to be used in the same manner as like gear for example like gear has decades of research behind it where we have enough information where we can make semi-informed decisions when taking it but with psalms it's such a new thing it's mm-hmm. kind of like yeah fair enough fair enough mm. now uh anyway the other thing i wanted to bring up 
as well was uh what was I gonna say there was this one question that I actually got asked uh, later on down the line but uh what do you feel like is gonna be the most detrimental thing to the fitness industry in the future that's not media light related that's a big one I'm gonna ask because I feel like how much are we driven by media these days in the fitness industry mm. So not media related? Anything non-media related, yeah. I think it's the education and the barrier to entry. Mm -hmm. Because nowadays, um, nothing against all those guys that say, for example, I saw a few people graduate from fit college mm -hmm. and it seems to be that's like a, a pump, an endless pump, more graduates, more graduates. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering, what is the education like? What kind of, let's say, regulations are there? Mm -hmm. And I feel like maybe the fitness industry should be regulated Mm -hmm. um, let's say, for example, uh, you need a bachelor of, you know, exercise science yeah. to actually get a job um, and progress, versus mm -hmm. just um, paying a few couple hundred dollars and signing up to a certificate three and four, and jumping straight from the classroom into a job straight away, where you have little to no experience. Mm -hmm. So I think it, education. Yeah. Well, here's the thing. Since we're on the topic of that education, yeah. right? I'll tell you this. So I had one guy whose name he works for PT. He's, sorry, he runs PT Mechanics, mm. Adam. He was telling me the reason why the the PT uh, in so the PT industry itself and the industry itself is such such a uncharted waters is because he says it's like this. I mean, he goes, "What's your education?" I was like, "Oh, well, I went to UWA." And okay, okay, how long did it take for you to get a degree? And I was like, three years." Okay, do you know how long it takes to become a plumber? I was like. I would say three years. How does it take to become a lawyer? I would say seven years. And it's like, okay, well, do you know how long it takes to become a PT? And I was like, I don't know, six six months. He goes, six weeks. Mm -hmm. Can take up to six weeks. Can take up to some people less. Because what these places are providing, like Fit College, I don't want to bag them out specifically, but these places will allow them to get that certification. They're a business at the end of the day, and they care more about mm -hmm. making the money rather than yeah. the educational side of things. Mm -hmm. So... Where, 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 it, and also, did you know that the average time as a PT now has gone down dramatically? Back in the day, um, it used to be, uh, like if you make it past the first six months, you're cool. But now in this day and age, because of COVID, it's three months. Mm -hmm. If you make it past the first three months, you're good. In, in you, you can be in it for a while. And the other reason, which I've also spoken about this a lot, is the whole concept of online training. Yeah. <laughs> mm. You mentioned this. I you? mentioned yeah. this because it gets me riled up so much. <laughs> so I waited at least two years before I even had the idea of doing an online client because that's what I thought you were supposed to do. Mm -hmm. But nowadays I keep seeing all these people who have no qualifications whatsoever. They actually go straight to online. I'm like, hold on a second. That's a privilege, not a right in my books. Mm. Yeah, you got to spend some time in the trenches, mm. one on one, yeah. like learning how to interact and actually deal with clients, and yeah. then moving that platform to an online sort of base. Yeah, but it's so easy, like as you said, to just skip that and go online. Mm. Um, <clears throat> and a lot of these people, obviously, they get clients through their Instagram, how like all these shirtless pictures, looking shredded, that kind of thing. Just because you look the part doesn't mean you know how to get there. It might just be. You got lucky with the genetic lottery. You're on. You're on gear. You're taking psalms, that kind of thing. But at the end of the day, you don't really know the information or the education. Yeah. Plus, it's like the other problem is the people who. Again, it goes back to the idea of being a business, but the people, the places that you go to where you they coach you on how to go completely online. It's like a course on its own, and you hire them like you would hire a PT. And they're like a ridiculous amount of money, like 4K, 5K, all that. Of course they are. So they'll find anyone. They'll find a guy who's only been coaching for two months. They'll get him on board or they'll find someone who just looks good. And they hey, have you ever think about online coaching? Because it's a business opportunity on its own <laughs> and all that. So yeah. have you ever been approached by something like that? Yeah, it's like, oh, how to 10x your income, how to um, four, <laughs> yeah. four times your clients. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How, how to how to make sure your clients don't don't leave? Yeah, it's all the time. I think it's a very lucrative lucrative business because of the lifestyle. Mm -hmm. uh, everyone thinks they can just hop on a computer, be naked, jerk off, and program at the same time. You know <laughs> what I mean? Yeah, it's very fancy, but people don't understand that it 
requires no experience, right? And yeah. anyone can do it. So therefore, it's not really unique. So I think the unique thing is learning on the field first and applying those values and principles and transferring them online. Yeah, so I'm with you, Joe. But the thing nowadays, anyone can pay a bit of money to download something, let's say, for example, True Coach, um, pay for licensing or 50 clients or so. What is True Coach? It's a training app. Okay. So you can be a coach and you can uh, have, I don't know, let's say, for example, 50 clients. Okay. 100 clients, 150 clients, and you can coach them through that through that mode. So through online training, give them the program, weekly feedback, reviews, all et cetera. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a tool that trainers just use in period. Yeah, yeah. So um, I coach through True Coach. Okay. Um, through Richie's gym, and I also receive coaching through True Coach as well. Now, when you at, oh really? Yeah. So when you actually sign up for that thing, do you have to prove it all that you're qualified, or can you just no, say, no? You can oh. do one right now, man. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's, that, that's what I'm saying, right? Yeah. It's a money thing. Yeah. That's where the software devs they love it. They just create popping up software, and um, people, let's say, are fresh out of college, uh, want to be a PT, want to have an online platform, just download that, pay a subscription, get some clients, and that's it. That's yeah. crazy, man. Yeah. And also it adds value to people's services as well. So if you're, let's say you're, you're an online PT that uh, PTs through Google Sheets and WhatsApp, for example, mm -hmm. versus someone who has an app, you have the right to charge more because you're paying for a su subscription service already. Correct. Yeah. I do use an app. I use Trainerize yeah. myself. Mm. and But then that's to justify my cost. I say, mm. look, you... When you work with me, you know, you're not pa I always tell people you're not paying for the one hour through the 50 minutes to see me. You're paying for everything, yeah. you know, so it's the chicken and all that. And then again, it just comes down to the last thing, like transparency. Mm -hmm. The last thing I always tell people, it's okay to tell people you don't know. Uh, should people, people should understand that. Like um, uh, when I'm inside my scope, I can tell people this a lot. I do not know everything, mm, a, a whole lot about nutrition. I read about it, learn about it. I have no qualification. Even though I know more information now than I knew back then, I still don't like the idea of like giving away meal plans. And it's actually illegal to do that as We're well. We're not allowed to. Yeah, yeah. not allowed yeah. to. That's the, main, that's the main thing. That's the problem I have it as well. So when you sign up to these like online coaching, how to, um, you know, get online clients, and they say, oh yeah, just download this app and just give meal plans each week. I'm like, fuck, hold on a second. Do you know how dangerous that is? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Very. But turns out it's not illegal in America. No oh, shit. Mm, yeah. Okay. Let, let's move. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let's go, boy. <laughs> anyway, guys. Um. Fuck. I'm sorry. Um. That's that's um. Oh, i coming to an end of that because I'm sorry. That's that's almost the end of the hour we have in him. Um. But Johnny, uh, I know it was a drive for you, man. But yeah, man, thank you very right. much for coming down. I'm here for you, bro. Yeah. And Mark, very thank you very much, man, for joining and holding on. Um. Cow, if you're listening to this, uh. I'm almost to 150 episodes. I am now five away. When I hit 150, it's going to be a Saturday session. 100%, episode. two hours. Still at yeah, burgers well, afterwards. Absolutely. Yeah. And that'll be a great way to celebrate. So, um, well, that, well, the place I want to go to is that place you went to like two days ago. Like, Com Compton's? Yeah. They don't open on Saturdays, man. Oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that, fuck it. Like, yeah, since yeah, we're yeah, talking yeah, about yeah. nutrition as well, but that <laughs> fucking thing. That's a big one. That, I know. that was far out. It's beautiful, man. It's beautiful yeah. there. And get the podcast to get sponsored by Compton Burgers, you know. Hey, every yeah, guest, yeah. <laughs> every guest afterwards just goes there. Now, anyway, guys, um, just give yourselves a quick shout out so if the audience can find you and all that before we finish this. Mark? Uh, you can find me on Instagram at Mark Y Warriner. Just it's training log, shirtless pictures, half naked, semi naked, that kind of thing. If you're into it, yeah. Um, <laughs> Putting up some serious RDLs lately too. Oh, dude, that wrecked me yesterday. Mm. That fucked me up so hard. But yeah, Mark Y Warriner on Instagram. Yeah, if you want to watch Mark get fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> And for me, so my name's Johnny. You can follow me on Instagram at Johnny underscore Ruchis. So Johnny underscore R-U-C-C-I-S underscore Jim. All right, guys. Thank you very much for joining the Lost Set Podcast. And that is game.